My name is Sahil Bipin Deshpande. I'm a student of architecture from the Rizvi College of Architecture, that is Mumbai University. And currently, I'm doing my research fellowship, where I'm kind of taking this research forward, and I'm getting much into the details of Mumbai. So, uh, yep, yeah. as you can see, uh, this is my this was my topic. Uh, says sanitation, a case study across eight metropolises, towards framing a sustainability-oriented urban manifesto. So, firstly, I'll introduce the cities that I visited, where I had broadly categorized into three <coughs> different things. Uh, so, the first city that I visited was Johannesburg in South Africa and from there I moved to Pretoria again in South Africa. In terms of South Africa, I was looking forward for the informal settlement of Soweto. From South Africa, I moved to Kenya where I was in Nairobi. Again, an informal settlement in Nairobi called as Kibera, Kambimuru in Kibera. Uh, followed by that was the European continent where I was first in Zurich. Uh, from Zurich, I went up to Oslo, then I went to Paris, then I went to Tampere, Helsinki to understand the dry toilets, how they work and all. Uh, from Helsinki, I moved to Belfast and then got back to the Asian continent where first I was in Shanghai. From Shanghai, I moved to Beijing and then back to my country where I was first in Delhi and Alwar. Uh, the thing that you can see in the right is my competi competition entry. Uh, yeah. Now, Talking about my topic, uh, <coughs> this was in order to understand the, the scenario of sanitation overall. So, it says that what is happening to the urban poor is a story not just of income poverty, but many other forms of deprivation. The quote highlights one of the basic but grave concerns of the urban living in the cities of the developing world. For example, for the urban poor, it's not just the income that is an axis of deprivation. There are a lot more axes of deprivation, including sanitation. Yeah. So one of my own grim and troublesome experience in this regard has been the issue of sanitation. And unfortunately, it is a topic that people are often shy to discuss. Uh, also in terms of architects and our practices, we tend to we tend to focus more on the broader aspect of forms and space where we kind of miss out on these smaller aspects of the urban planning level. So uh, yeah, also it says that the reluctance to engage in this kind of activities has resulted in 2.5 billion people in uh, all over the world without having proper access to sanitation and like 1.2 billion who have no, fa no sanitation facilities at all. So this is a kind of a large number which is scary. So it, in terms of architects, we need to do something with, with respect to this uh, entire urban planning. So this was my proposal which, which I tried to give in order to understand the sanitation at an urban planning level and to see how things can be tweaked and can be uh, put up in different contexts all over the world. So, talking about the Indian urbanization, uh, India, shares India shares most characteristic features on the ongoing urbanization with other developing countries. The country is in a state of acceleration in the process of urbanization. The unchecked influx of people in the existing and the new urban centers has resulted in 17% of the population of <coughs> India having no toilet, having no access to sanitation facilities at all, and around 50 to 80% of the wastewater being disposed of without any treatment. Uh, talking in terms of Mumbai, uh, Mumbai it is like an example of a of a city magnetizing migrants by its opportunity, but it leaves them hapless to discharge in the urban immediacy. Yet, it still depends on the sewer system that was laid like a century back. The system is yet accessible for the slums that house more than half of the entire urban inhabitants. Also, the accessible system proved to be insufficient, compelling one out of 20 inhabitants to release themselves in the open. This, along with poor hygiene practices, are a result of the number of deaths and illness amongst children and is a nuclear cause of the economic failure and the shrunken opportunity to many more. So, it shows like even if it's if in, even if it's like a smaller aspect of sanitation, how it how does it affect the entire country's prosperity? What I had done is I had kind of categorized my entire research into seven different points. With the first point, I spoke about the policy framework. Talking in terms of policy framework, in order to meet the city's urgent need for sanitation, uh, a lot of policies need to be drafted. Many times, it so happens that these policies are drafted without considering the context. So it is, it is of a greater importance to understand the context and then to draft the policy according to the context. So in order to understand this, I, uh, I was kind of, uh, I kind of came across like two important policies uh, that had had that have had a large impact in terms of India, which was uh, 
the National Urban Sanitation Policy uh, as well as the Slum Sanitation Program. The National Urban Sanitation Policy, it focused more in terms of uh, the rural development as well as uh, in terms of the urban, urban level planning. What happened out here is without considering the context, it was being applied to a lot of parts which was kind of not good for the policy to work out at a longer stretch as in the policy it couldn't be much sustainable uh, the second policy it spoke about the slum sanitation program which is like as, as you know like the, the slums are more than 50 percent of mumbai's population so uh, the second policy it spoke about the slum sanitation program in which they kind of got more of uh, the community development programs in it and that's how they were kind of promoting sanitation so now uh, this was the situation what was happening in Mumbai so in order to understand uh, good practices I came across two different sets one was talking in terms of the policies in the informal settlements so I had selected the city of Soweto and in terms of the formal settlements I'd uh, I tried to understand the policies that have been drafted by the EU that is the European, uh, the European Union so this is Soweto uh, this is in Johannesburg uh, Republic in South Africa so what happens is in Soweto, it, Soweto it is the southwestern township in which a lot of Africans were being pushed in order to work on the gold mines out there. If you can see, this is the existing scenario and the entire thing is on a low line. So what happens is during rains, this entire thing gets flooded where sanitation, uh, is, sanitation is too bad if you can see. These are the current scenarios uh, and I, I kind of got through a lot of interviews to different kind of people having like all different, uh, all different thoughts about san sanitation as such. So it was including a few, a few good interviews, who, which were like uh, a few good interviews in all the world's different languages. For example, there was one that was like Kosa, the way that you pronounce it, and uh, all these different people had like a same opinion in terms of sanitation out there, which was, uh, which is kind of good. So if you see uh, the, the, if you see these toilets are placed here and here and uh, this was the kind of services that they had and this shows what exactly was the living condition in Soweto. So what the government out here has done is it has drafted this policy it's called as the white paper on the basic household sanitation which emphasizes on the provision of basic level of sanitation to the houses with the greatest need. So uh, people from Soweto, so uh, what happened is people from Soweto they were categorized into three different groups that is one was the lower income group the second one being the middle income group and the third one being the higher income group and they were given uh, houses houses were allotted on the same categorized uh, so if you see this was the house that was given to a lower income group so people from here will be shifted to you uh, and what the government is expecting is the policy should work in such a way that uh, this will get into the prosperity of the city itself so so this was the, the houses that were provided for the lower income group then these are the uh, houses that are provided for the higher income group and then you see the middle income group so uh, what was the main aim of the policy was as you see the, the key to this white paper is that the provision of the sanitation services should be demand driven and community based with a focus on community participation and household choice so this was in terms of the informal settlement that I could cover out there in Soweto. In terms of the European Union, uh, what what basically I was looking for was the kind of uh, the kind of norms that the European Union has set up for each city to follow. It's mainly concerned with the collection, the treatment, and the discharge of the urban waste, and the treatment and the discharge of the, of the urban waste, uh, where all the cities have tweaked themselves in order to follow these common norms. So uh, the example that I've taken out here is uh, is of the city of Belfast, where uh, where the city has taken an initiative to uh, understand what exactly are the requirements in terms of the wastewater treatment and how has the city entirely developed according to that. So this was uh, this was a part of the wastewater treatment plan. It, it's more into the technological terms, like how exactly it works. So as you can see, uh, household industrial rainwater roads and cleaning activities all the waste is taken to the sewer lines which is further taken to the treatment plants from here uh, based on the kind of uh, based on the kind of uh, outputs they want it is uh, divided into four steps one is the preliminary step uh, in the preliminary step what happens is uh, uh, the preliminary step in the preliminary treatment sorry what happens is the first thing is screening where large objects are taken out from the sewer 
and then the entire thing is put forward for a primary treatment. Uh, in the primary treatment, it is divided again into two parts where it is either settled sewage or the sewage sludge. So the entire the entire wastewater gets into these tanks where if you see these are, these are the screener, screeners in which the screeners break down the, the higher molecules into like lower substances and uh, the entire sludge is taken out and depending on each city's uh, depending on the each city's rules uh, it is either put it into incinerators or either they use it as fertilizers so and then yeah the uh, as i said like if in case it is needed there will be tertiary treatment that will be taken and then the entire water will be let into the receiving waters so yeah this was in terms of belfast that i was i could visit was the northern ireland wastewater treatment plant where if you see this force it talks about the screening part from here the entire process starts like this is a preliminary treatment then the this entire part is the primary treatment uh, where higher compounds are like broken into like smaller molecules uh, followed by this uh, after the, after that process is the secondary treatment in this treatment what what exactly happens is it's it's more or less a biological treatment uh, in which uh, uh, activated bacteria are being put up and with the help of this is the aeration that is happening and because of this uh, the bacteria thrives on the entire uh, on, on the oxygen and it kind of break down those bigger molecules into simpler substance more after this this is the kind of water that that is let into the receiving waters and uh, since it was in belfast the government doesn't allow to use the the byproducts uh, as fertilizers so what they've done is they have incinerated it out here uh, it was quite a good study for me to understand like how has each government set up its rule for example uh, in belfast the government had put up it directly into the incinerators when i was in oslo i did i did come to know that uh, the government out there has allowed people to use the uh, to use the waste products as fertilizers so uh, i'll explain that <coughs> once we come to the side also so uh, yeah now the second point uh, was to understand design of cities overall sanitation system so uh, this mainly was concerned with my different categories so it was informal settlements and the formal settlements that mumbai is made up of so in terms of the informal settlements i was as i said i was in this uh, informal settlement of uh, kambi muru that is in kibera in nairobi and in terms of the formal settlement i was in I was in the city of Oslo, where I, I kind of tried to study what exactly has the city done in order for the waste management. So, if you see, this was a toilet installation done by the Aus University out there in Oslo, where uh, the students had taken an initiative to understand how can the entire wastewater be treated <coughs> and used on site. What they had done was they had added a few things, such as uh, if you see, this is the UDDTs, that is uh, urine diversion uh, systems, and then you have the vacuum urinals and uh, the accessible basins as well as the on-site treatment plants so this was just a part of like how will they treat their own uh, waste where it was again taken uh, as i earlier stated it was again taken to the sewers where things were taken out during uh, screening and then the entire process now see you, out here even you see is uh, the wastewater that was being taken away uh, to the receiving waters now uh, as I, as i earlier mentioned this was a city in which they use the fertil uh, they use the byproducts as fertilizers and the entire uh, heat generated during the process was being used to uh, uh, to run the uh, the wastewater treatment plant out there so yeah so this covers a part in which uh, it talks about more of the the centralized systems uh, also what the city, the city government has done is in terms of the solid waste management it has kind of uh, separated all different solids so that it can be recycled and used and um, the next thing talks about uh, how exactly has the city tried how, how how exactly has the government tried to incorporate in each and if different uh, as an each and every different aspect of uh, of uh, waste management and uh, this talks about uh, this was in terms of the decentralized system that I kind of studied out there, which was in the clustering apartments in Oslo. So all these different parts, they club together and they make one network. That is how the city of Oslo works in. So this was something that I was interested to study when I was in Oslo in order to understand if I want to tweak up these policies and if I can use them out there in Mumbai. So. Uh, yeah, talking in terms of the informal settlement, as I said, I was in uh, this informal settlement of Kibera. 
uh, which is in Kambe Muru, uh, so, which is in Kenya, uh, which is in Nairobi, sorry. And uh, Ka Kibera, it consists of like 13 villages, and I was in the village of Kambe Muru, uh, where the, the kind of sanitation it was, uh, the sanitation they had was kind of really bad. They had like around five different kinds of toilets. Uh, if you can see, this was the first toilet that I was being introduced to. Too. So this was like the pit latrines that they have. Uh, if you can see the kind of construction out here, what happens is because of this kind of construction, uh, this has given rise to a number of diseases. Secondly, uh, what happened is there were a lot of crime reports because of this. So uh, what, people what people generally did was they started releasing themselves into polythene bags and they just threw it out of the house. So now if you see Kambe Muru, it is more of this thing. So uh, as an initiative, what the WSUP, that is in the Water and Sanitation for Urban Poor, Kenya, what they've done is they have categorized these three different kinds of toilets, where the first one is the commercial block, the second one is, uh, the, the first one is the community block, sorry. The second one is the commercial block, and the third one being the bio, uh, the biodigester. So the WSUP has kind of, as, as you saw in terms of the formal settlements, that there was a network that was being laid. So what out here the WSUP has done is it has kind of laid a network which is connected to the condominium sewers which takes the waste across and then treats it. So uh, this, these were the community blocks which were connected to a septic tank and with the help of these galpa pumps it was carried to the condominium sewers. Now if you see the commercial blocks it was directly connected to the condominium sewers. What was the difference between the community blocks and the commercial blocks was uh, since this was directly connected into the sewers, uh, into the uh, in the condominium sewers, what it had was it had a lot of water facilities. So this helped to in order to flush the uh, the the sewers. So these are the two kinds, and then there was uh, the the bio centers that that the WSUP had set up. This was also in order to do uh, in or in order to uh, enhance on the the community uh, driven program. So. What, what generally happens is uh, out here on, on the ground you have like the, the services that are being provided on top on the first floor it was uh, the main activities such as like there was a kitchen that was being provided and on the top was the community activity so uh, when I was there there was there were screening soccer matches out there so this is the kind of uh, response that the community started giving after the installation of such kind of toilets and then they also had like uh, their own waste management happening but uh, <coughs> what happens is it is it is it was kind of interesting for me to understand what will happen in the long run for these kind of toilets because uh, uh, because it is it is crucial to understand that these toilets need to sustain themselves if they have to work it the way they want to so uh, so yeah so these were the different kind of toilets that uh, the WSUP has worked out in order to form this network so uh, yeah. Uh, the third point it spoke about uh, the mapping the socio-economic context of the urban fabric uh, of an urban poor neighborhood. So in this what I've tried to do is I've tried to understand <coughs> Mumbai, what exactly are the situations in Mumbai. So uh, if you see like 27.8 percent of the population is, uh, is of India stays in urban areas. Uh, in urban areas like there is <coughs> In urban areas, around 7.887 percent of the people uh, have they lack access to toilets. Uh, then it's about 8.13 percent who have who use community toilets, and around 19.49 uh, having uh, sh as in they use the shared latrines, whereas the rest have do do kind of toilets that are connected to the sewers. Now talking in terms of the waste, the waste management, what happens is. Uh, it, it shows that 18.5% uh, they do not have any drainage network, then 39.8% uh, are connected to open drains and then you have the sewer system. Uh, but it was quite interesting for me to understand that even if there are sewer systems that are being laid, uh, a lot of sewer systems, uh, a lot of sewers were directly put it into the, the water bodies which was like 50 meters uh, deep inside the Arabian Sea without treating the waste. So uh, what, what I was kind of understanding was what was the government initiative to help on these, these broader issues which they need to tackle to. So uh, yeah. then talking in terms of the design and the technological consideration of public toilets, I kind of 
try to understand what all how does how, how have different organizations uh, kind of come up with new issues of sanitation so in terms of uh, so in uh, so the first one talks about the Olympic Forest Park in Beijing where the community has kind of uh, adopted this uh, self-sustainable system where they kind of provide the toilets as well as they use they, they treat the waste and use it themselves so uh, so these are the kind of so this was like the the installation of urine diversion distribution technique at the Olympic Forest Park and then you have like a lot more categories to how how things should be accessible and yeah these are the toilets that I could visit and if you see the entire part this was based on the wastewater treatment so the entire waste from these plants were uh, the entire waste from these toilets were taken and uh, was treated on site and used on site so that was one uh, talking about uh, when I was in Helsinki I came across these uh, the dry toilets of Helsinki so uh, this was an initiative taken by the Tampere University in uh, sorry uh, not in Helsinki in Tampere so this was one of, one of the installation at the Tampere University in Tampere where uh, if you see this is a dry toilet and what happens is generally after the after the use of toilet they kind of uh, they kind of uh, put it into such a network that you can use directly the waste and yeah and again like a few uh, wastewater treatment plants that I could go and visit uh, where it shows the kind of screening happening then the entire primary process and the final water that is being put up uh, talking in terms of the local entrepreneurship it was a kind of an important study for me to understand how have these local entrepreneurs brought into the prosperity of the city so uh, I kind of covered two different categories one was uh, uh, one was uh, Mr. Trevor Muladzi that I could cover in uh, Johannesburg where he had done a lot of intense work with the school children out there and the second one was uh, in terms of India where I could study Dr. Bindeshwar Patak's uh, entire work which was based on the eradication of manual scavenging and provision of like low cost sanitation technology so uh, but what, what used to happen in India is uh, since the sewer system wasn't accessible to all uh, there were these bucket systems that were being practiced and due to the use of bucket system there was this gave rise to manual scavenging so uh, also what, what was prevalent in India was the, the existing caste system so the people from as mainly the women from the lower caste they were forced to do such kind of manual scavenging so uh, what Bindeshwar Patak, what, what Dr. Bindeshwar Patak did was he changed the entire system by changing the kind of toilets that were provided. So instead of bucket system, he kind of provided the toilets which were like, uh, uh, which were, which used water. So and these are like, uh, he, he kind of tried to, uh, to put in like low cost sanitation technology by using uh, the material that is like on site material. So he had provided all different kinds of toilets. and. Uh, because of this what happened is the bucket system was uh, bu the bucket system stopped but even then uh, in, or in order to generate some sort of an economy uh, the women didn't have such opportunities so what he did is he kind of he kind of got them into these rehabilitation centers where uh, he kind of gave them work so that they shouldn't get back to the to the demeaning practice of manual scavenging yeah uh, now in terms of Johannes book when I was Studying uh, the works done by Mr. Trevor Mulazi, it was it is kind of shocking for me because what he showed was what kind of if you provide a good public toilet, how is it going to affect the entire prosperity of the country? So uh, this was the this was this this is the school that I could go, and this is this uh, this is the work that uh, Trevor Mulazi has done. So if you see these were the existing situations out there this was uh, a school next to it uh, where these are the kinds of toilets that they had so uh, so uh, if you see the doors weren't locked as in the, there were no doors in fact the systems didn't work there was like literal abuse on the uh, the, the walls uh, the urinals didn't work out clogged up uh, basins and things like that so as a result of this what happened is the students out there they couldn't uh, for example if someone needs to go for the toilet and use the toilet he couldn't concentrate on what exactly is the teachers teaching so what Trevor did is he kind of provided only good kind of toilets and then after that he took a survey showing that uh, how does these toilets help students to understand as in how uh, to increase on their concentration in the schools 
So uh, that, that was kind of interesting for me to understand out there because uh, the, the survey clearly states that uh, when they had like these kind of toilets, a lot of students, what happened is, this was, a, this was a toilet which was surrounded by a few restaurants and bars and things like that. And since, since the students couldn't use these, these toilets, what they started doing is they started using the, the toilets that were present in the restaurants and the bars. As a result of this, they started smoking as well as the, consum the consumption of alcohol. So this is how the entire system was working out there. So after providing only clean toilets, what Trevor tried to do is he tried to just put up a small line in which uh, the toilets need to be clean and also he started educating the students how do you use it. So this is how he had taken an initiative to make a small, a small effect as in to make a butterfly effect. The next thing it talks about finance, maintenance and capacity building uh, where I kind of uh, was kind of understanding how does the entire capacity building in terms of sanitation works out. So I've taken an example uh, of again Beijing, oops I'm so sorry. Uh, so what happens is uh, I was kind of studying uh, the, the, the initiative again taken by the government out there to understand and put up a capacity building such that it should, uh, it should uh, provide the sanitation to such a huge mass that was coming for the Beijing Olympics and and also a few uh, a few considerations that the government had done uh, and then the next one was to understand the the sanisets in paris as in sanisets these were the uh, initial toilets which were then uh, replaced by sanisets it was done so because uh, <coughs> these toilets were based on the sewers and it, it needed a lot of water but as the city developed uh, water became an issue out there so uh, what what the government has done is they've kind of provided good type of toilet in which they use less water and things like that. So these were the sanisets in Paris. Talking about in terms of sustainability and sanitation, what my major uh, what my major key assumption is uh, that you can only you can only term a syst uh, an entire system sanit uh, an entire sanitation system sustainable if it relates to the context. If it, uh, what generally happens is. Uh, it, it is so observed that if in case a system works well somewhere, for example, if it works, if, it, if the system works well in the Olympic Forest Park, you kind of try to put up the same system in terms of Mumbai. But as you see, there are like smaller aspects of sanitation for, uh, I'll just give you an uh, example of what the, the person out there in Beijing told me. He was asking me if I was clicking photographs of the food that I eat. So at that time, I thought uh, he's just kidding. So I said, yes, I, I'm clicking because I, I, I like to try different types of cuisine. He told me you need to put that in the presentation because based on the food that you eat is the entire system based, so is the entire system laid down, sorry. So for example, if it is, if it is, if you want to lay, a, if, you lay if you want to lay down a system in Beijing, it has to cater to the population. Uh, it, it has to get into the population of Beijing, which has an intake of like simpler, com simpler substances. So, the entire system changed as per the food intake also. So, uh, this was a kind of study that I could do in terms of sustainability and sanitation. So, uh, yeah, for uh, this is an example that uh, see these are the UDDTs that were provided in a school, and the same thing were replicated in in terms of the sanit uh, in terms of the the primary schools in India, but it entirely failed because the kind of the kind of uh, mindset that people do have it is firstly it is important to change that mindset in order to make a sustainable uh, make a system sustainable uh, and um, yeah see if you see these were the, the, the kind of toilets that uh, these are the kind of uh, things that uh, were introduced in terms of the, the concept of courtyard the concept of courtyards but at the same it, it totally failed when it came across in the slums uh, so, uh, getting to the conclusion, uh, the, the above case studies and for that, in order to attain a sustainable sanitation at an urban level, uh, the following practices must be ensured. Where the first one talks about uh, sanitation has been accorded lower priority and there is poor awareness about its inheritance linkage with the public health. Generating awareness is crucial in order to change the public mindset. So, it is, it is important for us to make people understand what exactly sanitation is. So it is important for us to, under, to, to change these public mindsets. So, uh, the second one talks about sanitation investments are currently planned in a piecemeal manner and do not take into account the cycle of safe confinement. 
treatment and safe disposal. Understanding the entire chain from the micro level amenities like provision of toilets to the macro level amenities like the wastewater treatment plant is imperative. Advanced technology isn't always cost effective. An appropriate system should be considered after through deliberation of these contexts. Uh, sanitation has thus been provided. Uh, sanitation has been provided by the public agencies in supply-driven manner, with little regard to the demands and the preferences of the households as customers. It is essential to have the client and demand generation focus on it. So this is how it is important to understand what the community is and to get in the to to get the community into inside the system in order to system uh, in order for the system to sustain. Uh, Thus, sanitation is an evolving process, changing with culture, economy, social habits and resources. Yet, it should always aim to make sure that the system is running and evolving along with its context and not crumble if not constantly updated in terms of the short terms. And in terms of a long term uh, run, it should focus on increasing the standards worldwide and constantly setting higher benchmarks. And yes, uh, a few people, uh, as in a lot of people who helped me across the entire study. So, thank you. This was my presentation. Over.